Our main talk today, or the presenter of our main talk, is a member of our Oasis community. Uh, it's been, I think, her first time. Where is she? Where, we, okay, I'm gonna I panic to see it. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, she's gonna delve into a topic we really haven't explored yet, which is um, kind of the Hindu experience. Uh, and I think it's gonna be great to learn about this because we have so many people uh, in the Houston area that are Hindu, and we work with them, we live in the neighborhoods with them, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot about this. We thank you for sharing of your time and your experience uh, to uh, come up and uh, you know teach your community something about you know your life and the culture you come from. So let's give a warm welcome to Ranjani Shashat. This is a story about an ex-Hindu leaving God at the literal altar and getting her cast to take it off. Before I begin, I wanted to share the poem that actually brought me here to Oasis delivering my first and hopefully not last talk here. Um, I wrote it in a period of deep frustration with faith and the faithful, and I wrote it to confirm for myself in no small way that I was an atheist, that I had a lack of faith, a separation from faith. Um, so, this is a divorce from faith. This is done, the papers are signed, I got custody in my brain in case you're wondering. <laughs> okay. I could not believe in a God who demanded my belief. I could not believe in a God who was rooted in folklore and mythology. I could not believe in a God who took credit for my triumphs but made me bear my failures in solitude. I could not believe in a God who made me who I was and then abandoned me for who I was. I could not believe in a God who could not be the God of all people. I could not believe in a God who saw me as lesser or greater than others. I could not believe in a God who placed more stock in correct rituals and correct intentions. I could not believe in a God who spoke through others that did not speak to me. I did not believe in a God who sought praise and adulation. I could not believe in a God inured to human suffering. I could not believe in a God who sanctioned pain and death. I could not believe in a God who praises the faithful, but not necessarily the good. I could not believe in a God who valued tradition over curiosity. I could not believe in a God who denied me free thought and reason. I could not believe in a God who is of mankind, but not for mankind. I could not believe in a God who chose condemnation before understanding, and so I could not believe in God. Because it was the day that I woke up at 7 a.m. to play World of Warcraft before my brothers woke up and kicked me off. <laughs> On this morning, I found my mother staring fixedly at the rising sun. Not wanting to reveal my fairly selfish motives for waking up before 2 p.m., I looked out the window with her, squinting my eyes as I looked for like a weird bird or a car wreck. I knew it wasn't a blimp anyway because my dog would have sounded the alarm at the sight of her natural enemy. I'm not what? I began. After a minute, blinking back a hopeful expression or the premature onset of glaucoma, she murmured. My guru said that sunrise is when the sun's energy is at its highest, and you stare at it, and you absorb some of that energy for the day. Then she went downstairs for her first of three daily cups of coffee. My mom's foray in the photosynthesis was only the beginning of a series of odd, fairly desperate efforts to be a better Hindu. A journey peppered with communes, cults, and religious leaders who claimed the ability to levitate or survive on air or sunlight. Over the years, I deliberately walked further and further from faith while simultaneously and complete, completely coincidentally moving closer and closer to the Hindu temple in Carolyn. Uh, not my plan, it just happened. My mother has charted a different path towards orthodoxy. When I talk about my mother, please know that I love her deeply, that I see her multiple times a week, that she cooks me fantastic food, calls me my, her baby, does my laundry when I'm lazy, puts up with me when I'm being a brat, goes shopping with me, will come to my apartment on a whim to stock up my fridge and clean my house, but not without that tiny modicum of complaining because she's a mother and because she's an Indian mother at that. Um, nonetheless, she is a comically authoritative Hindu and the sort of mildly, hypocritically dogmatic person that we all know and love. Um, if you ever see her in public, give her a hug. She's just a fantastic lady, um, but she's also sometimes way too religious. Way too religious. Just don't tell me that. Ask her for like malai kofta and masala. Those and get someone invited to dinner. She'll love that. Just don't bring baby to it. <laughs> so the title of the 
song is Samsara, Faith and the Flat Tire. Samsara is a Hindu idea of the wheel of reincarnation. Your goal as a Hindu is to do your dharma or duty to such an extent that you can step off of the wheel and attain moksha or salvation. Um, it's like playing Monopoly, except God is the banker and you don't get to choose which piece you get because we would all want to be the tiny dog, because who wouldn't want to be the tiny dog? Which is all well and good, except that any religion, when it becomes a social code and a moral standard, doesn't function quite as well. When I abandoned faith, that is to say when I discarded it, it was because I knew that it could no longer stand up to my test of reason and ethics. First I want to say that I'm a bad Hindu, and not just because I quit being Hindu, but because it took me until my freshman year of college to find out that Hinduism is really not polytheistic. I mean, yes, it is a veritable clown car of gods. But apparently, I did not know this at the time, that they all apparently converge into one god, Brahman. Um, I was never invested enough to see if this was actually in the Vedas, or whether it was just a cop-out so Hindu Hinduism could tell the other things, Hey, look at me! I'm just like you! I got 11 D. I got I one god. I'm just one god. <laughs> in the religion club, Hinduism is a loner, despite having roughly one billion adherents, mostly by an accident of geography and or melanin. Christianity and Islam beef about the Crusades, Judaism and Islam bicker about the Middle East, and Hinduism twiddles its thumbs. Okay, there is a fairly frequent strife between Muslims and Hindus, but, um, but like most religious squabbles, this has nothing to do with the religion, but more to do with the political power plays. Which is the second reason that I'm a bad Hindu. I don't defend Hinduism. I don't pretend that it is the oldest faith or the most storied faith or that its truths are innately superior to any other religion's truths, which we all know are stuff and nonsense. Do you know how many religions have blood myths? All of them. Hinduism's version just involves a giant fish avatar pulling the first man to safety, because that's cool. Do you know how many religions have a savior figure or spiritual leader who gets killed in a dumb way? All of them. Hinduism's Jesus, Krishna, who is also a magical baby, who although he was once an adventurer like you, got killed by an arrow through the foot. Uh -oh. <laughs> I should probably add my disclaimer here that most of what I know about Hindu dogma comes from personal experience and or a fantastic series of Indian comic books called Amarchitakathas that while being mostly accurate don't delve too far into the actual scriptures themselves. Then again, if DC or Marvel released a comic book version of the Bible or Torah, you would all be the first to buy it. I know it. So, <laughs> so this is why my mother keeps threatening to leave the household gods, which are her most like, valuable possession, to my middle brother. And to be honest, I'd probably make a mess of things and stow them by my maple whiskey and just offend everyone. So it'd be, it's not a good idea. Um, so discovering all of Hinduism's idiosyncrasies at a fairly young age ought to have made me feel better about belonging to such a mainstream, normal faith, one that neither evangelized nor tried to convert. One that didn't damn, at least not in the metaphysical sense. But instead of seeing God, I saw the man behind the curtain. The social engineering that all religions and all faiths are. The convoluted codes and the moral ladder that is missing so many rungs at its base. The rituals that lack explanations and lack purpose and do more to shame than they do to bless. When you leave behind a religion, there is a sense of breakage. The same thing that you feel at the end of a relationship. That hope beyond hope and that isolation from the world of the faithful, the world that believes that it has a higher purpose or calling than you, because it can take these jagged pieces of logic and make them fit together, a task that cuts you when you attempt it. In Hinduism, the fracture you leave is deeper, cuts more. Hinduism and Indian identity are so tightly woven that the politicians who champion the division of India and Pakistan Envision India as a, Hin as a Hindu homeland, even though much of India has been changed, altered, or bettered by Muslim rulers. Hindi uh, Hindu nationalists, who are by definition religious radicals, dominate government. Mahatma Gandhi was killed by a Hindu extremists. We tend to forget that as Indians, the blood that has been shed in the name of Hinduism. And going home is harder. Being among Hindus as an atheist is an exercise in civility. Some rituals you perform unconsciously, bowing three times before the altar, lighting the incense, dabbing turmeric on the label of your new clothing as a blessing when you wear it, unconsciously repeating the word Sri Ramanakshay when you finish showering. That's what my mom taught me. I don't know if that's actually a thing. 
Um, staying vegetarian long after others you know have left the nest, not particularly belief behind. Singing Ganesha Sharanam Sharanam Ganesha, we feel alone, or in my case, have particularly painful leg cramps. Singing Hanuman Chalisa with a group because it is so familiar and so beautiful. These things are simple and excusable. Fortunately, I do not feel if any of you will single me out as being a bad atheist because I'm trying to avoid being beaten by my mother, who, as I described, has full-blown Hinduism and is highly threatening. <laughs> there are other things that I have summarily rejected. Um, I remember a Christian friend I used to have who prayed that she would pass her algebra test and who once said that she was praying for me because her pastor said that I would go to hell. I failed most of my algebra tests, but I'm proud to say that was entirely my doom. And as for hell, I'm pretty sure that hell is fourth period geometry in an 82 degree room where you have to eat Snickers bars to stay awake as your math teacher slash resident golf coach drones on about quadrilaterals. I've been there. It's okay. I'm fairly egotistical about certain things, and my intelligence is one of those things. I accept my faults, but I also refuse to give credit to the things that I know that I have achieved to a random deity. And I refuse to feel lesser because a deity did not choose to give me the gifts he or she gave to another. Einstein was great at math, but how good was he at describing how salty and deep and green and mottled and iridescent bodies of water are? I'm the middle of NaNoWriMo, and I'm going to include that last sentence in my workout, just so you know. I also refuse to believe in a faith that does not want me to question the world. It wants me to blindly believe what it prescribes. I cannot value any faith that forces you to rely on that faith instead of on your own tenacity, on your own common sense and reason. My dad is not in the audience, so I can say this. I think that astrology is bunk. And I say this even though my uncle is an astrologer, and by profession, and a very nice man. I think that swamis and gurus are hats, and because I was that kind of kid, the last time my mom tried to take me to her swamis lecture, I spent the whole time writing bitter and sarcastic comments about the speech in garbled Latin that probably said something like this, oh my god, look how dumb, see stupid man, why does he think stupid? I wasn't great at Latin at that point. It's kind of embarrassing. I majored in it eventually. Um, I'm a little better now. This is the same man who told my mother that he could levitate, and she believed him. Not because she is unintelligent, because my mom has every accounting certification and master's known to men, and she can probably write novels in BB script. But because she finds a deeper meaning in faith or anything else than motherhood or marriage or God help us accounting could ever provide, she turns to spiritual leaders for comfort and absolution. I never felt that as much as I wanted to. I never felt as if I were a part of something real and true in Hinduism, but I feel that now, deeply centered in my atheism. One thing you lose when you lose your faith is that sense of community, that feeling of mutual belief that so many of us seek or have sought. I grew up at Meenakshi Temple in Pearland. We were there several times a month. My uncle was and remains a board member. I played with the priest's children and ate lunch at the priest's small houses behind the temple, which were then dark and squalid and not at all dignified. I swung on the swing set until I made myself nauseous and ate cheap lemon rice to douse the fury of my stomach. Nope, I'm wrong. Oops. I screamed profanity at peacocks because that's what you do. I ran around the temple grounds, went to the temple bookstore, twirled on my fancy papa day, we washed off my feet outside the main building, dabbed kumkum and manjul and vibhuti on my forehead, and then licked the vibhuti, the sacred ash, off my finger. Only later, because my brother made a point of telling me and gloating about this, did I realize that vibhuti is actually purified cow dung. <laughs> I still lick it as a guilty pleasure because I'm going to lie to myself about cow poop and gelatin. Those are my two cheats. Then we stopped going to the temple. I played video games, honestly, and I would rather stay home and play those than spend a rainy Sunday going to the temple and trudging around in the mud. Um, and I also blame the fact that being a tomboy and being awkward and self-conscious, that's even harder when you have to wear Indian clothes to attend and nothing really looks right on you. And after a while, my mom stopped asking. This was my first vacation from Hinduism. I now consider myself a Hindu expat. Because my parents were homebodies, and because most of my friends threw weekly or monthly pujas or garbas, or other things we didn't participate in, they maintained a tie to Hinduism that I did not or could not, not when it mandated a social interaction I didn't enjoy or believe in. 
I never belonged to this group anyway. I was a band nerd, a web design nerd, a book geek. I was a Hindu too, and quite possibly my mother had anything to do with it. I was a better Hindu than most of them. Uh, but the nature of these religious groups is that they're only inclusive if the people who run them believe in inclusion and believe in equanimity. No group I've ever known has possessed these qualities. I felt excluded in middle school and college. When I attempted to return to the fold, I found that I was frequently the only one challenging the scriptures we read, forcing them to stand up to the tests and needs of the present day and not the past. The day I gave up was when, after four years of fairly regular attendance, better than I've been doing here, honestly, one of the officers asked me if I was a new member. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> the day I gave up was the day I stopped trying to be Hindu. Because I realized that for years I'd been playing a part to make others happy, to make others like me, to catch someone's eye. My brief membership in these groups was basically as desperate as signing up for ChristianMingle.com. Please notice me! The truth was that I had stopped believing in the faith years before, when I stopped going to the temple and I stopped praying and nothing bad happened. And when I started praying and nothing good happened, on account of her. And if good things happened to me, I found it was largely because I had worked for them. I stopped believing when I realized that Hinduism had never tried to teach me my morals. It had instead taught me how to form a relationship with God for personal providence. And as much as I love the great state of Rhode Island, I was not interested in that. I stopped believing when I realized the figures we idolized, Rama, Krishna, even Gandhi, were all deeply flawed, egotistical, misogynistic. I stopped believing when I learned about the caste system, which is basically a system of institutional slavery. Uh, it's a Hindu construct, and it makes things pretty simple. Separate the world into five categories, the educated Brahmins, the warlike Kshatriyas, land-owning or land-selling Vaishyas, the artistic and handy Shudras, the isolated and mistreated Dalits or Jandalas who fill the gap. Make caste hereditary so that everyone always knows their place. Make the slow turning of the wheel of reincarnation skew itself so that people are born and reborn into the same caste, imprisoned by their social standing. And so the authors of young adult novels can pretend they're being clever by sort of leading an uncommonly attractive protagonist into one of four distinct factions or houses or tribes. As an author, that bothers me. Um, Casts suck. Casts are the reasons why some people don't get married, why some people don't get educated, why people grow up in poverty, and why people leave Hinduism. Even if you're a Brahmin, there's no guarantee that you're the right tribe for Brahmin. Unsurprisingly, my mother thinks that other variants of Hinduism and even other types of Brahmins are lesser heretical populists. There are about a dozen different castes, and within those there are about a hundred different divisions. There's a hundred different types of being Brahmin and other subcastes. I don't even know the difference, except to say some of them are spelled differently, and I don't even know if that's the case. Um, but if you go to shadi.com or thamilmatrimony.com or any other Hindu marriage sign and try to list yourself, you will see how many different castes there are, and it's crazy how many subdivisions people have. And it may be something simple like, oh, we wear kumkum on Wednesdays and you wear it on Tuesdays before lunch. You're different from us. Get out. Right? So pay careful attention if you list yourself to what the site asks you about your skin tone, your graduate degree. Those things are really important to get married in India, just so you know. Um, there is a story from the Mahabharata that has stuck with me. I read the epic, which translates to the Great Birth or the Great India, so I could write a senior thesis about it that I thought my mother would appreciate. I know, I know. I studied Greek and Latin. I could have written about anything about the Roman Republic, which I adored. I can tell you all sorts of fabulous stories about Caesar and Cicero and Pompey, and did you know that Pompey wanted to use elephants in a triumph, but the elephants were too fat and it wouldn't fit through the gates of Rome, so Pompey threw a fit and the Senate was like, I told you so, and that's a whole thing, apparently. <laughs> so you know. Um, instead, I chose to write a comparative thesis about the Iliad and the Mahabharata. I said to tell the world that I could be the worst Hindu in the world, but I still understood the faith better than most people. I thought it would bring me closer to faith to know these epics and to know these stories, but then I read about Karna. Karna is the first and eldest child born to Kunti, a princess, the senior wife of Pandu. Pandu's five children, with the exception of Karna, would be called the Pandavas, uh, which is also a pun on the Sanskrit number pan, which means five. 
These children are beloved by the gods. They're great warriors, born to be kings. The thing is that Bondu didn't really conceive any of his children. Bundi had to call on the gods to uh, do her a favor. When she was young, she tested this boom. Teenage pregnancy, here we go. Um, by calling on the sun god Surya, and she became pregnant. Freaking out because she was still unmarried at the time, she set the baby to float down the river wearing Surya's armor and Surya's earrings. And he was raised by a charioteer and his wife, um, far below his stature as a working class child. Um, his half brothers, all of whom were raised as princes, mocked him and excluded him. Their weapons master, Drona, refused to teach Karna because of his low birth. When Karna went to the Swayamvara of Draupadi, which is the marriage ritual where a girl picks her husband by a test of faith and a test of skill and archery and that kind of stuff. Um, I kind of want to reinstate that because that's kind of cool. Yeah. It's like if you if you want to marry me, you gotta shoot like an arrow through like fifty thousand axe heads and see if that works. And then if not, oops. <laughs> I mean, at some point, the rhythm does kind of make up for itself. So that's kind of cool. But... <laughs> um, when he went to the Swayamvara of Draupadi, the princess, he was second only to Arjuna, who was one of the Pandavas, whom the gods favored. When the Pandavas and their cousins, the Kauravas, met in battle, Karna understandably sides against the Pandavas because they mistreated him his whole life. Unlike the other Pandavas who display cowardice or greed or wrath or dishonesty, Karna is uniquely moral, true, and righteous, and brave. In a fight against Arjuna, who is his equal or his lesser in the epic, Karna realizes that he is fighting not only his half-brother, but also the gods Krishna and Hanuman, who are protecting Arjuna and giving him good weapons and ensuring he doesn't come to harm. As the heroes sweep towards one another in their chariots, Karna's wheel is mired in the mud and devastation of the battlefield, or perhaps trapped there by God's manipulative hand. As he kneels to free his wheel, Arjuna decapitates him. The great hero is killed because his back is turned. Krishna, or Karna dies, and Arjuna attains glory. No one names their sons Karna. No one reads the Mahabharata and can think that its writers, although it wanted readers to recognize Karna's nobility and strength and courage, favored Karna over Arjuna. Denied and denied and denied, the story of Karna resonates deeply with every Indian who is lower, lower born, with every Indian who sees that caste as a socioeconomic anchor and that too often caste and skin color are intermingled. That in India uses Hinduism as a way to hold down the hopeless and then champions it as a faith of the righteous. That Hinduism is like any other religion, just as sordid, just as selfish, just as divisive. I stopped believing when I realized that Hinduism and Indian nationality were inextricably entwined and that by maintaining one to a certain standard, you maintain the other. You separate the chaff from the wheat. For starters, you segregate men and women, cut them apart using religion as a blade, unless society perpetuate that inequality. Hinduism is terrible to women, or should I say, women, men who hide under the banner of religion are terrible to women. But India, having such large portions that are poor or minorities, and who do not have access to economic privilege that would alleviate their lack of social privilege, they can't protect their women, nor can ever regard them as equals. For a religion that has as many female goddesses as it has, Durga and Sarasvati and Lakshmi, it makes very few accommodations for its female population. There are temples, even here in Houston, that ask men and women to sit separately as they worship and make sure women sit behind the men. Um, women are disproportionately, disproportionately punished by infanticide, by honor killings, by social prejudice against dating, against sex, against Americanization. Good Indian boys are subtle. They are discreet. Good Indian girls are always visible, never suspect. Krishna's wife must always be above suspicion and such. Once my mother made a point of asking me if I was on my period in order to ascertain whether she had to purify the house, and if in doing so, bar me from the altar room. She claims that the statute exists to maintain cleanliness and purity. I argued that a faith that really cared about cleanliness and purity should make a better job of making sure men wash their hands after going to the bathroom, and doing a better job policing child molestation and rape. I ate cereal for dinner that night. 
<laughs> the next day, when she asked if I had stopped believing in Hinduism, and I shrugged and said, maybe, over a plate of frosting slather toaster strudel, she panicked and asked if I was going to convert to Christianity and get married in a church, because this is her greatest fear, apparently. But I told her that I was actually an atheist, or agnostic, because I used that word around my mother to make her feel better. Um, she calmed down and left me alone. So apparently this is better than it could be. Um, and she's like, well, at least you don't believe in Jesus. <laughs> I don't know why this scares my mother so much. You have to understand that when most mothers' nests empty, they buy puppies or take vacations or try to ply you with food in return for grandchildren. My mother went to India and got branded. Branded. With an iron brand and fire, and she's about to do it again, too. Uh, brands of two religious symbols important to her particularly orthodox ver version of Hinduism, which her Swami suggested that she should get. Brands which got infested because India is a cesspool, and my mother slathered silver burn cream on them and went on with her life because that's how she rolls. If you ever doubt how faithful my mom is, remember that. Brands. Some of you don't even have tattoos and know those tiny hearts on the inside of your wrists and ankles don't really count. <laughs> so. A brand is a Hindu equivalent of getting a full sleeve pin-up model version of Krishna smiling seductively, which is something I'm now adding to my list of things I can do to make my mother angry. <laughs> in leaving Hinduism, I feel more connected with others, more tolerant of others, those of faith as well as those without. I see the beginning of the universe not as a divine accident, but as a spark glimmering in the infinite black. I see worlds beyond worlds and stars beyond stars, and I am glad because denying the existence of a creator has allowed me to see the beauty of creation and those who have been created by stardust, by cosmic circumstance, those who are here to find their own purpose and hopefully in the process help those around them become something more. This is where I leave the wheel of reincarnation, and I leave it spinning its jaunty, irregular rotation in the hopes that it will, through the alchemy of time, become something more and something better. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Just know that I am a bad Hindu, and the most I ever got out of Hindu Sunday school was why you shouldn't color in Ganesha gray, because although elephants are gray, he is a god, and damn it, that's not right. <laughs> I was Alliance. I had a rogue. A rogue who had mostly green gear at level 60. I was 14. It's not my fault. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. It, it was a question about World of Warcraft. It was. It's a video game on a computer. It's a lifestyle. Right. There's, there's two factions and it's a war. Okay. There we go. Okay. Hi. Branding? Have you ever heard of uh, the Shankar Chakram? Uh, I've not heard that kind of thing. Okay, my mom is, uh, oh, what does she call it? She calls it, she's, she goes to like the Andavan ashram or something. Okay. And the last time we were in India in 2009, she just decided, hey, I'm gonna get branded. And she had this whole thing set up. And she came home and she was like, ah. Because she just got burned by fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, another thing, uh, yeah. uh, from uh, what I learned uh, from growing up in India, essentially. Yeah. Um, uh, coming here, uh, is uh, Sunday school kind of normal here? Because I've never heard of any of my classmates, even the uh, the Brahmins who yeah. are more uh, religiously inclined, go uh, for formal Sunday schools or something like that. It was at Meenakshi Temple. It was just like, mm. like random things some fa some parents started, and they just had kids show up for Sunday school, and we didn't learn a lot. We just colored. <laughs> and my mom had already read me all the epics, yeah, as bedtime stories, so I knew all those stories, and I was just like, why am I sitting well, here? Just we can be talking about stuff. This would be great. Just as a background, yeah. uh, I know my, uh, some of my cousins do go to this school, yeah. these schools, uh, around, like, a couple of temples around the, uh, the Sugarland area, yeah. essentially. Uh, so, it seems like it's some kind of a new thing, it's sort of like uh, things copied up over from so. Christianity. Yeah. Uh, That's what yeah, it feels like, like to me. They're like, the Christian kids go to school on Sundays, Hindus kids usually go to school even more. Who yeah. doesn't love school? Yeah. So, it's a particularly Indian thing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Oh. So it's your way over there, David. Just yeah. shout it out. Oh, yeah. Have you... So uh, with regards to marriage, I know in my 
community, there was is still a lot of pressure for people to marry within the Jewish community. Right, There's yeah. still that pressure from your family, even though you've eschewed the faith. Yeah, so my mom is more, oh gosh, my mom. She's a, when my brother got engaged, he got engaged to a South Indian uh, doctor. This should already be like top of the line here. Um, but she's not the right type of Brahmin, so my mom was kind of beefing about that for a while. She was just like, oh, she could have been so much better. And this time around, she's like, I'm going to get it right. I'm going to set up my second son with like someone from a nice family, from a nice cast or something. And my brother is marrying like another Brahmin who's not the highest or whatever. And she's like, dang. And she looks at me and she's like, I just give up. I'm not doing it. <laughs> she knows I'm going to put up a fight, so. I mean, the version of arranged marriage that my mom kind of practices is I'm going to give you five different options that I have pre-selected and vetted, and you can date some of them, you can talk to them, and then if you like them, and because I like their families, you can marry them. And we'll all be happy. Because you're marrying into a family in Hinduism, you're not just marrying into a person's life. So you have to think about the in-laws. My mom is more about marrying the in-laws. She's more concerned with that. She's like, I hope I like them. Otherwise, this is going to suck. <laughs> you might have to get divorced. <laughs> The title of your talk, what does samsara mean? That's the wheel, kind of. You go through the wheel of reincarnation, you go around, 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 and eventually you just get let off in heaven, or the other place. <laughs> so they do have a concept of hell? Uh, kind of. I think it's more that living and going through that circle again and again is hell, right? And maybe you get lower and lower, you're like, I'm a cockroach this time. I'm gonna live forever, but it's gonna suck. <laughs> kind of thing. So, um, is it common belief then that when you know the bad things that happen to you in this life are because of stuff that happened in previous lives? That yeah, the word karma is a set of things. Yeah, yeah. We have karma and we have dharma, which is duty, what you have to do. And if you don't do that, you're gonna have bad karma. So, uh, just for completeness, do these in-laws know and agree that they are inferior? <laughs> <laughs> about this kind of thing. It was kind of tied to other stuff, but it's more that my mom is not discreet or subtle about <laughs> some of it. So, she's a nice lady, she just needs a little more tight. <laughs> the way I understand it, um, in reincarnation, you can come back as a different animal other than yes. human, but uh, so there are, I guess, several different animals you could be reincarnated? Anything, why, pretty much. Why, why Anything. are cows? considered so much more sacred. As well. Oh, it's just because they're a symbol of wealth, right? They're a symbol of prosperity. So they create milk, they can, well, you don't eat them, but they are property and you value them as such. And there's also a god, Shiva, who has a cow kind of follower named Nandi, and it's a sacred figure. Um, but by some strange circumstance, peacocks are not as sacred, swans are, you know, whatever, and they're also symbols of gods. Um, tigers, no, we poach them. So it's just a cow, I guess. <laughs> I do not. I accidentally had a piece of chicken once. I thought it was like bad eggplant. I spat it out. So I'm kind of conditioned against it by now. Do, um, uh, do you see a trend among young adult, um, you know, P you know, Hindus that you know that are also becoming secular? I mean, is your story unusual among your groups of friends and acquaintances, or is it something that's? Um, I think it kind of goes both ways. I think I see people who are becoming more religious. The group I attended in college at UT was um, Hindu Students Association. So we just met and we just talked about stuff. And there were some people that were really, really faithful. Um, and then there were some of us who were just there because they'd have cookies every now and then, free t-shirts, that kind of thing. And it was kind of cool to talk about it, but I know a lot of people on both sides. And then there's some lay people in the middle who are kind of like, I'm Hindu until, you know, but I don't really go to temple. I'm just kind of, my mom told me I'm Hindu, so I'm Hindu. <laughs> Is there an equivalent to like the Sabbath, like, you know, Sunday for Christians? Every you know, day. So every day? Every day. Wow. <laughs> My mom does like some sort of puja or something every day. Um, if we actually like let school out by the Hindu religious calendar, we'd never be in school. Kind of thing. There's something going on every day. There's wow. lunar holidays, there's like bi-weekly things, there's like a day you fast every week, which my mom does, but I don't, because wow. I like eating. <laughs> Are we over here? Yeah, Richard. Uh, a friend of mine who is a passionate Hindu, and I think relatively high caste, um, he, we used to argue religion a lot, you know, uh, and he used to like to say that, you know, Hinduism isn't a religion, uh, you know, and uh, 
So, so what's the story with that? It's, it's, it's an identity. I mean, you're born into a culture, but it's also, but it has gods in it. How can it not be a religion? You have to, I mean, they make you believe in stuff. Um, but it's also the culture of how people are treated and how people interact with one another within Hinduism. I mean, it's, it's become something huge because India has been so staunch about implementing it and making sure you have temples everywhere that people go to and there's festivals everywhere. Um, but it's a religion. It has to be. I would, I would disagree with your friend. <laughs> okay, we gotta wrap it up. Let's give it a big.